Good morning once again. It's great to uh, see all of you this morning and look forward to worshiping with you today. We had a great time at uh, community camp yesterday. Thanks to all those of you who volunteered to uh, make that an excellent thing for us. We hope that you uh, had a good time there. Uh, also hope that you pray for the, uh, those who are still there. It was very dark last night. And there are probably people who are still trying to find their way out of the campground. So hopefully they uh, can find some something to eat while they're out there looking for civilization once again. We, I don't know. I don't know why I say the things I say. We're in uh, the book of Malachi and we're finishing the book uh, this morning. We've already already uh, covered all the text in it, but what I wanted to do, as I mentioned last week, is just kind of revisit a few of the things that I, I think God is saying to our church through His Word, through that, things that I want us to be reminded of before we move on to um, other passages of Scripture that we'll be studying in the coming months. We're not going to be in one single place in Malachi today, so you can go to the book if you'd like. We'll be skipping around. I'll have some of the verses on the screen behind me, Um, but again, we're going to just talk through some some main things that we want to take away from this book. Most of us, I think, have been involved at one time or another in a he said, she said situation. A he said... She said situation is a circumstance when it is one person's word against another. And I will give you an example of the kind of this kind of situation that happens at my house. And hopefully this doesn't make you think less of us. But you know how sometimes you get home and uh, you're going to have dinner. You go in the freezer for something, is getting things ready for dinner, and you see there's ice cream bars in there or... Ice cream sandwiches, you think, that'd be nice to have after dinner tonight. I'm looking forward to that. So you, you have your dinner, you clean up, you know in the back of your mind it's coming. You open up the freezer, you reach your hand in the box, and then feel around in the box. <laughs> and there's nothing in there. And you think to yourself, what kind of people <laughs> would do that? I live with the kind of people that would do that. And you know exactly in your mind, because you have prior history with these people that you live with, you know exactly who probably did it. But when you confront them about it, they have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. They didn't even know there were ice cream bars in the freezer to begin with. That's a he said, she said situation, and the only way you're going to solve that is if you install cameras above the freezer to monitor who's coming in and who's coming out. If you're married, you have experienced a he said, she said situation, and if you are a husband, you've lost. (laughs) Most of the time, in those kind of situations, the stakes aren't really high. But there are situations in which the stakes are much higher. In fact, there are whole classes given to people in, who work in HR about how to deal with those kind of situations in the workplace where you have somebody has made an, alleg- an allegation of harassment or a manager has made an accusation against an employee, an employee has made an accusation against a manager, and yet nobody was around, there's no evidence that any of this has happened, and so the person in HR is left trying to sort out what exactly has happened. And of course, there are difficult cases in the criminal justice system where an accusation is made, but that accusation is denied. There's no evidence. There are no witnesses. It's just one person's word against another's. And when it's just one person's word against another's, it can be very difficult to find the truth, what really happened, what really was said. Well, in the book of Malachi, we have God making a series of six accusations against his people. In fact, this whole book is organized around accusations that God brings against his people. And one of the things that will just jump out to you right away if you just read through the book in one sitting, which would take you all of 10 minutes, 
But one of the things that will just immediately jump out to you as you read that is that whenever God makes an accusation against his people, Malachi records the people's disagreement with what God has said. And there are three words that point that out, which you should know by now, and you do know by now because you've called them out before. But those three little words are the words, but you say. God makes an accusation against his people, and Malachi records the people's disagreement with what they say. But this is not a he said, she said situation where it's God's word against theirs, and who really knows what happened or what's going, what's going on. God's perspective is perfect and infallibly correct in every way. He is always in the right, and they are always in the wrong. I've been struck by that as we've studied through this book over the course of the past few months together. And I've asked myself the question, how often does God's word, what God says about something, directly contradict the things we say or the way we think or the things that we do? How often do we find our word to be in contradiction with God's word? As Christians and as followers of Jesus, hopefully our goal is to align ourselves with God's word so that in any given situation, regardless of how we feel about it, whatever God says is what we say. And this morning, as we finish our study of Malachi together, I want to go back now and I want to highlight three things that God has said to his people in this book. And these three things that God has said to his people in this book are as true for us today as they were when they were spoken to his people then. Here's the first one. He said he loves us. He said he loves us. This book has a lot of difficult things to say. And if you've been with us for our time going through Malachi, then you'll know that God does not at any point in this book pull any punches whatsoever. He raises several accusations against his people. In fact, the very last phrase of the book is the phrase, utter destruction. And the, 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 what he is saying at the end of the book is if God's people do not repent of their sin and turn to him, there is a warning of utter destruction coming to them. Their destiny will be no different than the destiny of the surrounding nations who do not love, worship, or follow God. Of all the things that God could have opened the book with, he could have talked about how often they dishonor his name, how often they distrust him, how often they disrespect him. But what God leads with in the opening of this book, in the very second verse in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 2, is these four important words, I have loved you, says the Lord. I have loved you. But the people question God's love. They're looking around at their circumstances. They've recently been brought back to the land after being captured by the Babylonians, deported, taken into exile. They've been brought back into the land, but it's not what they had expected or hoped it would be. They are this relatively insignificant people among the vast Babylonian empire. They've been able to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. They've been able to rebuild the temple. But they know that the grandeur of the temple that they have now doesn't even begin to hold a candle to what Solomon had once built and which had been destroyed. As they look at their circumstances, they're questioning whether God really does, in fact, love them. And so God reminds them that the proof of his love is not to be found in their circumstances as they look around. The proof of God's love, he tells them, is in his sovereign election of them, his sovereign choice of them. 
And that's supposed to bring comfort in his love because what, what God is telling them is God did not look down on them and see that they were an imminently lovable kind of people, just the kind of people that God would choose to be his own. He didn't look at all the nations and say, there's a good one. Those are going to be my people. No, God loves them and made them his own uh, special people and his treasured possession because he chose to set his love on them. Of all the things God wants his people to know as he begins this book, the first is that he wants them to know and believe that he loves them. So let me ask you a question this morning. How often are you prone to doubt God's love? I, personally, have no problem affirming God's love for us. I have no problem whatsoever affirming with all of my heart that God loves you. But I have difficulty sometimes believing that God loves me. And maybe you do too. What makes us call God's love into question? Because all of us... If we were asked the question this morning, every single one of us would answer the question, does God love his people that he shed his blood for? Absolutely, we would say the answer is yes. But why do we have problems sometimes affirming it in our heart of hearts? God loves me. Have you ever run your hand across a wooden railing while you've been out somewhere and caught a little splinter in your finger? And that little splinter that's found itself, it's found its way under your nail or into your finger has lodged itself so deep in there that while you're out, you're not able to remove it. You can try to, to press it out. You can try to gouge it out with your, with your other hand, but you've got, it's, it's worked its way so deep that there's no way to pull it out. And so you can get on with your day. You can go about doing the things that you're doing. But every time you pick something up, you're reminded by that little pain point that there's a, a splinter in your finger. And I think doubt is kind of like that little splinter, that sliver of doubt that inserts itself into our hearts and makes us question whether God truly loves us. What causes us to doubt? What drives that little splinter into our hearts? I'd suggest a couple of things. First, our doubt is often produced by our own sin. It's easy for me to say that God loves you because I don't know what you look like on the inside. It's harder for me to affirm what the Bible says that God loves me because I know who I am. None of you know who I am, but I do. I don't know who you are inside, but you do. We know our hearts. We know the wickedness that lies within us. We know the things that we have done in the past. We know the sins that we are struggling with in this very moment. The entangling sins that the book of Hebrews talks about, the besetting sins. We know the people that we've hurt. We know the relationships that we've broken. We know the kinds of things that come back to our minds when we're trying to go to sleep and all of a sudden reminded of that thing we did that we're ashamed of. It can be very hard for us because we know our own sin. It can be very hard for us in Christ to to say without an asterisk, God loves me. 
Our sin makes us doubt whether we could really, truly be loved because love is always a transaction for us in some way or another. Being loved depends on being lovable and staying lovable. Yet the Bible says this in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The difficult thing to wrap our minds around is that God didn't get into this relationship with us only to find out who we really are. All of us have gotten into relationships where we thought a person was a particular way only to find out that we didn't actually know that person as well as we thought we did. All of us have been in relationships where the person has changed. They are no longer the person that they once were. But I want you to know something. As you look at the darkness of your heart that you can feel and experience sometime, God did not get into relationship with you only to find out that you're actually a lousy person. God chose to enter into relationship with you knowing exactly who you are. And what does that say about the depth of his love? The Bible says that what God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And let me just speak a word to those who are here with us this morning who may not be Christians. There's a word that we use all the time in church. It's the word gospel. It's a Bible word. And the word gospel means good news. And the reason the gospel is good news is because of verses like Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Because it gives hope to people like us and it can give hope to people like you. Christianity is different from every other religion and philosophy because it does not tell you what you must do to approach God. It tells you what God has done to approach you. While you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. And friend, if you are here this morning and you don't know Christ in that way, the thing that you need to understand is not to put it off until another day when you've got your stuff worked out a little bit more. When we come to Jesus in repentance and faith, we do not come and put our best foot forward. When we come to Jesus in repentance and faith, we come as we are saying, there is absolutely nothing I can do. You must change me. And when we come to Jesus repenting and believing of all that he accomplished in his life, his death, his burial and resurrection, he gloriously forgives, cleanses, and saves us, which is why we never get bored coming to church every week and singing the same songs and talking about the same gospel. If you do that this morning, you will experience an unconditional love that you did not think was possible. And believing friends, do not Make your sin bigger than your Savior. And do not allow your, the sin of your heart to make you doubt God's love. Remember, while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. A second way this sliver of doubt gets inserted into our hearts is not only our sin, but also our circumstances, the things that have happened to us, the things that are happening around us, things like illness, things like loss, things like betrayal. 
it is so easy for us to slip back into that default where we use our circumstances to be an indicator of God's love. And so if things are going well in my life, God must be loving me. And if things are not going well in my life, then I must have slipped up and God is making my life terrible. That's not how it works. We too easily assume that if God really loved us at any given time, he wouldn't have allowed fill-in-the-blank to happen. He wouldn't have let that loved one die. I wouldn't struggle so much financially. That person wouldn't have abandoned me. And the list goes on and on. But friends, our circumstances are not reliable indicators of God's love. Because the Bible tells us that we live in a world that is in, very, in a very real sense cursed. We live in a world that is poisoned by sin and the effects of sin. We live in a, in a broken world that every day cries out for mending. But even though we are sick and even though we lose people and even though we have terrible things done to us, God wants us to, according to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse, verse 19, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. That's an oxymoron, knowing something that can't be known, knowing something that surpasses knowledge. God says, I want you to, to know something that you will never in this lifetime and ever truly be able to comprehend. And God doesn't just want you and I to have an intellectual understanding where, okay, I've read the Bible and I know that it says that God loves me. God wants you to know it in your mind and he wants you to believe it in your heart. He wants you to feel it. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16 says, So we have come to know and to believe. You said the, the believe word is a faith word, and faith is just not head knowledge of a, of a series of facts that can be bullet pointed out. Belief is not only the knowledge of facts, but it is the volitional, wholehearted, giving oneself to the truth of those things, believing those things. 1 John 4, 16 says, So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. He has said he loves us. What do you say? Do you believe it? Secondly, he has said he will make everything right. One of the dominant themes throughout the book of Malachi is this grappling with injustice everywhere. Significant Portions of the book are devoted to grappling with injustice in the world. God's people were frustrated by the injustices that surrounded them at every turn. They looked and saw that apparently God not only turns a blind eye to those who do wickedness, but God actively blesses those who are wicked. And so they were asking themselves the question, man, if the wicked get blessed, if, if, if God doesn't just choose to look the other way, but actually blesses them, then what's the point in serving God at all if this is the kind of deal we get? And those of us who have faith in God, we feel the incongruity of the world that we live in. The way it is, Versus the way it's supposed to be. We encounter those things every day. The way it is versus the way it's supposed to be. And as Christian people, we struggle with the fact that we, we know who God is 
and we know the world that we live in. And so we've got a God who tells us that he is all powerful and all good, and he tells us that he loves us, and yet we live here. And why doesn't God just make it all go away? One of the things that God tells his people in the book of Malachi is that he is going to make it right. And that promise is both a warning for us and it is a source of hope. It's a warning because God says that he is going to come swiftly. But in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 2, the question is asked, who can endure the day of his coming? God wanted his people to remember that his judgment was impartial, which meant that he may well be coming in judgment against them. All of us want justice on everyone else. All of us believe in our hearts that our conception of justice is the right one. But the warning for us is that God will come, his judgment will be impartial. And we should make sure that his judgment is actually not facing us. So it's a warning for us, as it was a warning to them, but it's also a source of hope. The promise to make everything right gives us great hope. God says he will draw near for judgment and he will be a swift Witness against wickedness that comes in every shape and size and form. He promised at the beginning of chapter 4 that his wrath was burning like an oven. God wanted his people to remember that he had not turned a blind eye to them. And God wants us to be reminded of that this morning as well. If ever there was a time when the church needed to hear this, these are certainly good times to hear them. We live in a day where there is much political turmoil around us, where the cry of everyone is justice. There's much hand-wringing on both sides of the political aisle. And there are some very real moral and political issues at stake. And it would be a mistake for us as Christians to fail to steward our citizenship. Well, it, it is true that we are citizens of another country, a better country, but we are also citizens here. And as citizens here, we have a responsibility to steward that citizenship well, which means our de desire should be the just, righteous character of God on display in our lives, our families, our neighborhoods, our cities, our society. But we must also remember that the kind of justice for which our souls long will always elude our grasp. And that takes the pressure off of us. <laughs> because that means that our hopes are not ultimately tied to what happens here. In other words, even if it gets bad, we're still going to be fine. <laughs> because Jesus has promised to make everything right. Revelation 19 speaks of a God whose judgments are just. And then Revelation 19 goes on to describe the coming of Jesus, describe what he's like. And it says, beginning in verse 13, he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. Verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. One of the things that I love about the Bible is it constantly challenges our conception about Jesus. And this 
picture presents a Jesus who treads the winepress of the wrath of God with a robe dipped in blood and an iron scepter to rule the nations. God said he was going to make everything right, and Revelation repeats that for us. It tells us, look forward, it's coming. God said he was going to make everything right. What do you say? Thirdly, God said his name is great. His name is great. You may have noticed that Malachi has a favorite title for God. It's a title that he uses over and over again. And that title is this, Lord of Hosts. Did you notice that as we were going through the book? We haven't called it out in the messages very much, but one of Malachi's favorite titles for God is Lord of Hosts. In fact, Malachi uses that title of God 24 times in these four short chapters. There are other books in the Old Testament that use that title more often uh, in, in, in total, but Malachi uses it with the greatest frequency of any other book. That Hebrew term is Yahweh Sabaoth. And that Hebrew word Sabaoth is most often used to refer to an army. So we could ask ourselves the question, why does Malachi choose that, why, that to be his favorite way to refer to the Lord, the Lord of hosts? Well, there's a note in the ESV study Bible that offers a suggestion that I think is helpful. It goes this way. In the post-exilic period, okay, remember post-exilic is after the exile, after the people have been brought back into the land after being in captivity. In the post-exilic period of Malachi, the postage stamp-sized Judah, as a tiny province within the vast Persian Empire, had no army of its own. It is precisely in such times when God's people are painfully aware of how limited their own resources are, that there is no greater comfort than the fact that the Lord has his invincible heavenly armies standing at the ready. How many of you have at one time in your life felt the vulnerability of powerlessness? whether it be in the workplace, the courts, your family? How many of us have felt the vulnerability of powerlessness? There is this great story in 2 Kings chapter 6 about the king of Syria. The king of Syria is trying to attack Israel. And he lays traps and ambushes for them on on multiple occasions. And it seems like Israel is just always one step ahead of him. And he gets angry. He he, He blows a stack and he starts asking his advisors, who's the rat? That's my paraphrase of the Bible there. But he's asking the question, who's the rat? Who is loyal to the king of Israel? Because every time I try to do something, they're one step ahead of me. And one of these advisors has the, uh, the boldness to speak up and say, there's this guy named Elisha. And he says, you can't speak a word in the privacy of your own bedroom that doesn't get reported to him. God tells Elisha everything that you're going to do. There's no spy. There's just no place you can get to be away from God. And so the king of Syria says, okay, now I know who to kill. And he immediately sends his army to the city of Dothan. Don't think it's Dothan, Alabama. (laughs) But he sends his army, his chariots, his warriors to Dothan, 
and he surrounds the city. And when one of Elisha's men wakes up the next day, he walks out of, he walks out of the house and looks and sees, we're surrounded by an army. And he says to Elisha, alas, what are we going to do? And this is how Elisha replies in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. He said, do not be afraid. It's the first crazy thing he says. <laughs> Surrounded. Don't be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Okay. Verse 17, then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young men and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. They thought they were surrounded. <laughs> But it was the Syrian army that was actually surrounded. And God delivers them that day because as Elisha had said, open his eyes so that he may, be, he may see those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Knowing that flips everything. <laughs> the people in Malachi's day needed to know and believe that though they were just a, a speck, in the Persian Empire, they need not fear. This term, Lord of hosts, Lord Sabaoth, is the term that Martin Luther incorporates into his, his hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Luther is standing up against the church and against the government, and he's experiencing even perhaps the loss of his life. And one of the hymns that came out of that that he wrote that we still sing to this day is that song, A Mighty Fortress. And in that song, he chooses to use this term. He says, you ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is he, Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. In addition to this title being used over and over again throughout the book, you may have noticed, I've tried to draw it out, that God continually expresses a concern and a desire for the greatness of his name. I want to read Briefly with you, every reference in Malachi to his name to make this point, because we need to see it together. Beginning in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 6, he says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts, to you, O priests, who despise my name? But you say, how have we despised your name? Chapter 1 and verse 11. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Next verse, verse 12. But you profane it, referring to my name, when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, its food, may be despised. Then skip to 114. Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations." Chapter 2 and verse 2, if you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 5 of chapter 2, my covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16, Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. And lastly, 4 and verse 2, 
But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Is there any lack of clarity among us about how seriously God takes his name? God's name stands for all that he is and does. And in Malachi's day, we see God's name tarnished by his people, trampled in the dust. Their actions show how little they think of God. The fact that they would bring sacrifices to him that are lame or sick or blind or stolen. They think very little of his name. But God's righteous desire is for his name to be great among his people once again. But God's desire for his name to be great extends beyond just his people, but to all nations of the earth. God says that his name is going to be great among the nations. His name is going to be feared among the nations. He says that people will say, according to 1 and verse 5, Great is the Lord beyond the borders of Israel. It is treason of the highest order to think small thoughts about God's name and who he is. And this is not just a desire for his name to be magnified and glorified. It is a demand that will be met by everyone someday. This desire for the global glorification of God's great name will be accomplished by God's power, which according to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, has seated him, that's Jesus Christ, at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Friends, we are a small piece of the nations that God promised his people in Malachi's day whose name, who, who, would, who would see God's name to be great. The Bible tells us that by virtue of Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection, that he has been raised and crowned. He has ascended up into heaven where he is seated right now, reigning at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. God has said that his name will be great, and he is making his name great through Jesus Christ because the name of Jesus is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And you may not fully see it now, but man, we are all going to see it. And we're going to see it soon. Does your life, does my life, show a commitment to the glory of God's name? Or does my life say, eh, it's cool for Sunday? God has said his name is great. What do you say? There is no he said, she said situation with God. There is no situation where it's God's word against ours and either of us could be right. What God says, we ought to say. Malachi means my messenger. God sent Malachi his messenger millennia ago. But the message that he delivered to God's people, to to them at that point, is every bit as true to us today. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, you have said that your name will be great. And we believe that you will make it so. We thank you that you have worked in our hearts to believe it now. That we have the privilege of gathering each week and worshiping you as a foretaste of glory divine. We pray that you would be magnified in our hearts and minds. We pray that the slivers of doubt that creep into our hearts would be removed, that we would take you at your word. We pray that you would help us to eagerly await the making of all things new. And we praise Jesus, the name that is above every other name. It's in his name we pray. Amen.